I was watching the Tour de France and in the early stages there have been a number of crashes and one of the guys has broken his scapula, he's fractured his scapula. Now what cyclists tend to do is to break their clavicle, right? This bone here. But he's, and Richie Port's done that and he's out of the race. But um, the scapula, this bone here, I realised we haven't really talked about much. Let's have a look at it in detail because it's got quite a bit, few bits to it. And this rider has fractured his scapula and he's still riding. So first of all, we'll, we'll talk about um, what the scapula does vaguely and where it is, because it's quite an interesting bone in the way that it's, it's not like other bones. Um, and then we'll look at the major lumpy bits and then we'll look at kind of the edges and what have you. And we'll talk about the glenohumeral joint. I'm not going to talk about ligaments. I'm not going to talk about muscles. Um, I'm pretty, we've already done the muscles. I'm pretty sure we've done the ligaments. If we haven't, I'll do that again. Today is about the bone. So the scapula, what have we got going on here? Well, this is the thoracic cage or these ribs here. So the scapula is on the posterior thoracic cage here and yeah, you can feel it moving around when you move your, your upper limb. Um, and the reason it's interesting is that unlike most of the other bones of the body, which are anchored at either end to two other bones or something like that, so they all hinge together and what have you, the scapula, what's it attached to? Well, it's attached to two other bones. It's attached to the humerus, but the humerus is really hanging from it. And that give us, gives us the glenohumeral joint, that ball and socket joint of the upper limb. But then it's attached to the clavicle here, and that's it. Um, posteriorly, it's, it's floating free over the thoracic cage. And in fact, it's held in place by a number of muscles. We've got trapezius up here, we've got the rhomboids over here, we've got the rotator cuff holding the, the humerus into the glenoid fossa. So really, it's an attachment site for a whole load of muscles. And what the scapula does is, um, by being so freely mobile, when you move the scapula and it rotates, we have rotation in these two ways. Um, and as it rotates, it changes the direction in which the glenoid fossa is pointing. So you can raise your arm this high without moving your scapula. But if you want to point to the sky or scratch the top of your head, you've got to rotate your scapula so that the glenoid fossa is higher and you can lift your arm up into the air. And the other thing it does is it slides anteriorly and posteriorly, giving you increased reach forwards. All right, reach anteriorly as it slides anteriorly. So it changes if, we'll talk about the, the bony bits in a moment, but if the glenoid fossa is this bit here, and that's where the humerus is attached to, by moving the scapula around, we change where the glenoid fossa is pointing, which gives us the ability to put our arms in a wide range of three-dimensional spaces. So it makes the, makes the shoulder incredibly mobile, but also makes it a little bit weaker than, say, the, the hip joint, which is fairly mobile, but tougher. But to talk about the movements of the scapula, you really need to talk about the muscles that attach to the scapula. Uh, so if you want to find out more, go and watch uh, the, uh, you know, the rotator cuff video, because we've got a lot of muscles of the rotator cuff attached here, and also the large muscles of the shoulder video, and that explains um, how a lot of these muscles are moving the scapula and the whys and wherefores, right? If we're interested in the bony bits today, this is kind of a, an additional thing to those muscles. Right, so I've already said this bit here is the glenoid fossa. Um, typical, look, that's, that's the right side, all right, over there, this one. This one's the left side. Sorry, extra confusion. This one, this one's from over here, right? Right, okay. So, here's the scapula. And the thing you noticed about it first is that it's a very thin, flat bone. And in fact, if you look at a, a real scapula, it's often so thin that it's translucent. Um, it's a super, super thin bone. Look, it's, if this is the, this is the lateral side here. 
see how the lateral edge is a lot thicker and the medial edge is a lot thinner um, and it's a triangular shape and it has this this noticeable spine running across this bit here so what have we got well, this is the glenoid fossa here so this is the socket of the ball and socket joint of the shoulder and it's actually a very shallow socket and there is a glenoid labrum uh, like a band of connective tissue a band of ligament around here to make it a little bit deeper to hold on to the humerus better but the bone itself is a very very shallow um, socket ball and socket socket of the ball and socket joint right um, now the other thing we notice is we've got a couple of big lumpy bits here and here if ever we have big lumpy bits it's because we're attaching muscles to it um, now see this bit here this there's the clavicle so this the clavicle is up high but where the clavicle meets the scapula this is the acromion so acro meaning summit like the acropolis uh, the the summit the highest point within the city the acropolis acro the acromion uh, meon acromion meon Oh, what's me? Omos. Omos. Omos means shoulder. Acromion. So this is the acromion, the highest point of the shoulder. Omos. Um, so that's the acromion there. And the reason it's so big is, yes, you've got the trapezius and deltoid muscles and what have you around here. You've got loads of muscles attaching to it. But then the joint between the clavicle and the scapula here gets called the acromioclavicular joint. It's abbreviated to the AC joint. Um, if we haven't looked at the ligaments here, we really should. I'll, I'll do that another day. Um, but that's the acromioclavicular joint, that's the acromion. And the other thing, when we looked at this the other day, uh, the other week when we were looking at the muscles of the, of the elbow joint, the muscles of the upper limb up here, was we saw this. So we've got this bony bit poking through here. Um, I should probably do this side, it's the same. But you see this here? So we have another bony bit. So if the... If the glenoid fossa is here, and here is the glenoid fossa, we have a, a bony protuberance, this bit here. This gets called the coracoid process. Um, idos, oid, idos meaning shaped, coro, corax meaning, is that Greek? I think that's Greek for crow, corax, idos, or corax. I think there might be another thing for the coracoid. Anyway, um, crow's beak, looks like a beak, right? See, so this is the crow's beak sticking through here. This is the coracoid process. So then we have things like uh, uh, coracobrachialis. Coraco to the brachium, brachialis muscle running down here. So we have the, the acromion up high, the coracoid process projecting anteriorly, the glenoid fossa laterally for the ball and socket joint. And then we have this very obvious spine of the scapula running across here. And you can palpate these things on yourself. Um, so, if you follow the clavicle across, the clavicle becomes the acromion, and you can feel the joint in between the two. Um, the coracoid process you can feel, it's not very nice, but if you get, do you see where we are here? So there's the ball and socket joint, right? So if you get, if you get really in here, then you have a really good, ooh, a nice deep, oh, there it is, nice deep palpate, ooh. You can find the coracoid process, and if you rub out, well, it's not very nice. But, um, and then the spine of the scapula is very easy to palpate, even on your own back. It's a, it's a very obvious. Um, and as you move your arm up and down, you can feel how the spine of the scapula changes direction, which kind of gives you an idea of which way the glenoid fossa is pointing in, right? So you can palpate all of these lumpy bits. Now relative to the spine of the scapula, we can also describe some of these, these flat spaces here. So this is a fossa because it's a depression. So this fossa here is the supraspinous fossa, very sensible. And this is the infraspinous fossa down here. Uh, in, so the supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa. And if we turn the scapula around and we look at the anterior surface, 
So the subscapular surface, this becomes then the subscapular fossa. And do you see how this is curved? Which is why it gets called a fossa. The other thing you might be noticing here is this notch. And this notch then, can you see where it is? So it's between the acromion and this bit here. This gets called the, the suprascapular notch, that sort of. Just, it's kind of a distinguishing feature. It stands out a little bit, that notch. Now, as we've got our triangle, we've got three edges and three points. These, these also get named, but they get named quite sensibly. Here's the glenoid fossus. This is lateral, this is medial. Right, we're looking at this scapula here. So this gets called the lateral angle, this pointy bit of the triangle, this bit down here then, this gets called the inferior angle, and then this bit up here gets called the superior angle, superior, inferior, lateral. Very sensibly named. And then the, the edges, well, these are the borders. So this is the superior border, and then we have a lateral border, and we have a medial border, and that's it, all right? So you've got to, if you look at the scapula, it's quite easy to name the parts. Now the, the, the medial border, do you see how it's close to the vertebrae? So it sometimes gets called the vertebral border. Um, and the lateral border is out by the axilla. So sometimes this gets called the axillary border. Um, but but that's, that's about it. All right, those are the parts of the, of the scapula. A flat and interesting bone with a lovely shape um, but just a, a handful of features to remember the names of. And there are a whole bunch of ligaments linking all these things together. So there's a lot of complexity in the rest of the shoulder joint. Uh, so I guess we should be fairly thankful that the bones themselves are fairly straightforward. Notice that the, the acromioclavicular joint is superior. It's directly above the glenohumeral joint. And what we've got here with the shoulder girdle is we've got a suspension of the weight of the, the upper limb from these bones and from the axial skeleton. So we've got a bunch of, we've got some suspensory muscles here so that the weight of the upper limb or whatever you're doing with the upper limb is supported and hanging off the axial skeleton through these bones. So these bones are, are providing um, mechanical solutions to the problem of this highly mobile upper limb. And there you go, that's your lot, right? See you next time.